Uh, His Excellency Deputy President, Madam Deputy President, Deputy Ministers uh, of the Government of South Africa, High Commissioner of the Republic of South Africa in Singapore, High Commissioner of Singapore in South Africa, uh, Excellencies, colleagues and ladies and gentlemen, it gives me really a great pleasure to welcome His Excellency Deputy President of the Republic of South Africa, Sipokosa Paulus Mashatile, to the Liqua New School of Public Policy in our historic campus of NUS here in Bukutima. My name is Francesco Mancini. I'm a Vice Dean for Executive Education and an Associate Professor in Practice, and I'm honored to be the Chairperson for His Excellency Lecture on 30th Anniversary of Diplomatic Relation between South Africa and Singapore, celebrating a journey of mutual respect, strategic partnership, and cooperation. I actually remember when President Sere Ramaphosa, at the time in his capacity as Deputy President, came to our school in 2016. We're honored to continue this tradition with your presence today, so thank you for coming back to our school. Now, 30 years is an important milestone. They say that 30 is the beginning of true adulthood. It's when you don't just grow up, you're ready to start to show achievements. And in fact, the relationship between the two countries, Singapore and South Africa, is showing many results. Bilateral trade has grown by over 60% since 2018, accumulating to nearly a billion Singapore dollars of investment in South Africa. Singapore companies in South Africa are active in a wide range of industries, including agribusiness, urban solution, hospitality, manufacturing, ports, logistics, and innovation and technology. And when Prime Minister Lee visited South Africa in the past May, a business delegation comprising 17 Singapore companies accompanied him. Technical cooperation is also very strong, with many South African officials participating in Singapore capacity building programs. Singapore and South Africa has recently signed two bilateral cooperation MOUs, the Information and Communication Technology MOU, will enhance cooperation between the country's digital agencies, and the skill development MOU will deepen the collaboration in education and training. And on this topic, since we are in university, allow me to add that our school is also part of this growing engagement in education. I was in Pretoria just two months ago, where the National School of Government graciously hosted one of our executive programs in partnership with UNICEF. And I'm delighted to announce that we have now established a memorandum of understanding with the National School of Government. So I want to thank the school principal, Professor Buzani Kawaweni, uh, for the partnership. We look forward to continue this work in the future. Now, with that said, I'm delighted to leave the stage to His Excellency for his lecture. His Excellency, Mr. Shipukosa Paulus Mashatile, has been Deputy President of the Republic of South Africa since March 2023. He has a very long and accomplished career in public service, starting with his years of brave student leadership in the early 80s, all the way to become Premier of Gauteng, which is the province in which Pretoria and Johannesburg are situated in 2008, and then Minister of Arts and Culture between 2010 and 2014. Excellency, we are very grateful for you choose our school for your lecture. Welcome again, and you, the floor is yours. Professor Mancini, thank you so much for welcoming me. I'm very honored to be back here. Uh, the last time I was here was 2019, uh, where I had an honor of being awarded the Lee Kanyu you exchange fellow award um, so it's it's good to be to be back here let me recognize high commissioner uh, to south africa who has been working hard to ensure that we come here arif mantaha our high commissioner to singapore Ms. Charlotte Lobe. Uh, <clears throat> I'm accompanied by deputy ministers from 
South Africa. I welcome them as well. I'm told that there are ambassadors who have joined us uh, from various countries. Uh, we recognize you, your excellencies. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to convey my greetings as well, as well wishes to the people of Singapore from the shores of the mighty Indian and Atlantic Oceans and the people of our beloved country, South Africa. It is truly an honor to stand before you today to deliver this public lecture that commemorates 30 years of diplomatic relations, mutual respect, strategic partnership, and cooperation between our two countries. And this is indeed a historic moment. Through this lecture, we also commemorate 100 years of the remarkable legacy of the greatest leader of our time, Mr. Lee Kanyu, here at the Lee Kanyu School of Public Policy. It is a privilege to be at this prestigious school established in the name of Singapore's founding prime minister. Indeed, we remember Mr. Lee Kanyu as an outstanding patriot who dedicated his life and wisdom to the well-being of his nation. He, has an, he was an astute statesman whose passion lay in building a united and respected nation, free from want and ignorance. Thanks to his visionary leadership, Singapore is today a global model for good governance, efficiency, and economic prosperity. In recognition and celebration of this milestone, the South African High Commission in Singapore has held a series of events in collaboration with the government of Singapore to strengthen relations and reaffirm our commitments to the shared developmental goals of our nations. This visit is itself a demonstration of our commitment to strengthening diplomatic, economic, and people-to-people -people relations. We certainly look forward to another 30 years of diplomatic relations and beyond. While we celebrate what we have achieved thus far, I must emphasize that this is also an opportunity for us to prepare for future cooperation in many more years of friendship. Professor Mancini, I'm particularly delighted to be in this beautiful country once again since my last visit, as I said earlier in 2019, as the 68th Lee Kanyu Exchange Fellow. One of the things that I was inspired by during that visit was the commitment of the leaders of Singapore to the development and economic growth of their nation. The trajectory of Singapore reminded me of that of South Africa under the leadership of our first democratic president, Nelson Kholisatla Mandela, who espoused the vision of non-racialism, non-sexism, democratic, united, and prosperous society. President Mandela taught us the values of Ubuntu. Ubuntu, Ubuntu, Ngabantu. I am because you are. Coming here today, I am encouraged that your commitments have remained true and are evidenced by the inroads in the areas of education, technology, and urban agriculture, amongst others. Ladies and gentlemen, 
As we gather here today, several significant mega trends are currently affecting the world. This includes globalization, geopolitical inequality, environmental crisis, demographic changes, and technological convergence. For instance, the current global population stands at 7.7 billion. However, projections suggest that it will increase to 8.5 billion by 2030 and 9.7 billion by 2050. Half of the 2 billion people expected are expected to be added to the population are from the African nations. The challenge, however, is that the surge in population is accompanied by a rise in inequality, which presents a significant challenge to global unity and security, affecting peace and stability, especially in the African continent. Furthermore, there is a rapid urbanization of the world it is predicted that by 2030, 70% of people on the planet will be residing in cities. Governments and cities must therefore give priority to urban planning and ensure strategies that are capable of adapting to these changes. This entails making investments in the ecosystem and infrastructure required to provide a good level of living for all people. According to the 2023 Atlas of Sustainable Goals, the global Gini coefficient has fallen since 1990, from about 0 0.70 in 1990 to 0 0.62 in 2019, which represent significant progress in reducing global inequality. This suggests that although there has been progress in reducing inequality, there's still a significant gap between the rich and the poor. And more work needs to be done to promote economic equality on a global scale. Climate change is one of the most pressing issues of our time and poses a significant threat to humanity and the planet. It is a complex program, problem that demands urgent and consistent action from every individual, organization, and government. The effects of climate change are far reaching, and we need to be proactive in adopt, adopting sustainable practices to reduce our carbon footprint. The global community must unite to address this issue with utmost seriousness and commitment. I commend Singapore for its implementation of the Singapore Green Plan 2030 as a framework to both mitigate and adapt to climate change, and also the integration of urban agriculture as a critical component of developing a thriving and resilient city. What we see here is a true manifestation of the Malay saying, which says, I quote, Sikit Sikit Lama Lama Jadi Bukit, meaning little by little, eventually you can build a mountain. Inspired by this principle, we must begin to think about how we reimagine what successful societies should look like to effectively respond to these emerging trends, including the uncertainty of pandemics. Fundamental to this is that nations must invest in knowledge as a source of strategic resource. This requires that nations specifically invest 
in their people and data, particularly big relevant data. According to Do Hang Fan Khan 2017, a senior researcher in the social and economics team at the Institute of, for Governance and Policy in Singapore, and I quote, <coughs> using data to make decision is not new, but we have seen data produced at an unprecedented rate by the internet and mobile technologies. Yet, the revolution in data science is not so much about data itself, but the rapid advances in statistical methods and software that allow huge amounts of data to be analyzed and understood, close quote. Essentially, data plays a critical role in deepening the understanding of issues on the ground, thus leading to sound decision making and the successful implementation of plans and strategies needed to respond to the dynamic challenges of the world of today. Ladies and gentlemen, whilst the current global environment is fraught with polarity, Singapore, like South Africa, values the role of global governance and multilateralism in ensuring peace, security, and stability. And we agree that these are the prerequisites for a prosperous world. It remains unacceptable that in times of global crisis, reform of global governance and political and financial architecture remain elusive, despite our common interest in ensuring a relevant and re responsive architecture. Both Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew and President Nelson Mandela shared a vision of a world where war, famine, hunger, and insecurity become a part of our history and not our present. We must therefore continue in this optimism. Like President Nelson Mandela, and I quote, we know too well that our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinians. Close quote. Hence, we therefore believe that the only solution to end the Israel-Palestine conflict is a two-state solution where the nations should coexist. In this regard, we welcome the recent ceasefire which will allow for talks and the rebuilding of Gaza. Ladies and gentlemen, South Africa and Singapore enjoy long-standing and substantive relations, anchored by frequent high-level engagements, multifaceted cooperation in areas such as trade and investment, growing people-to-people -people relations, cooperation in multilateral institutions. Despite global challenges and cooperation in multilateral institutions, and despite challenges, including the recent COVID-19 pandemic, both governments have maintained close bilateral cooperation. Following decades of international isolation of apartheid South Africa and significant progress heralded through the peaceful negotiations, former Singapore Prime Minister, the Right Honorable Lee Kanyu, visited South Africa in 1992 and began a process of establishing friendship between the people of South Africa and the people of Singapore. This journey of friendship was fortified in, on the 29th of May in 1992 
when the government of the Republic of South Africa and the government of Singapore agreed to, uh, to establish consular relations. Our bilateral relations was fortified by the official visit by Prime Minister Lee Sing Lung to Cape Town, where our respective leaders used the opportunity for the two countries to strengthen their long-standing partnership and explore new areas of bilateral cooperation in addition to our current economic relations that are focused on trade, investment, tourism promotion, and skills transfer. One of the areas of collaboration between our countries that can be useful in addressing some of the domestic challenges posed by issues, amongst others, of corruption, lack of strong governance, and accountability is building state capacity. This strategic, organizational, and technical capacity, which I'm proud to say is an area we have collaborated with Singapore on, specifically as it relates to the following, building a professional, meritocratic, and ethical public administration, improving leadership, governance, and accountability, and ensuring a functional, efficient, and integrated government. Professor Manchin, a lot of the South African public servants have been trained here in Singapore, and we are grateful for the training that has been provided uh, to many of our public servants. I am pleased to announce that the National School of Government and the Lee Kanyu School of Public Policy have entered into a partnership and we wish to engage mutually on areas such as policy, innovation and sustainability, data analytics, future thinking, smart cities, and urban design, women leadership, and strategic decision making, amongst others. This partnership initiative take place against the backdrop of a memorandum of understanding between the government of the Republic of South Africa and the government of the Republic of Singapore on skills development, signed in May 2023. We believe that these partnerships with the National School of Government will translate into the delivery of key education and training programs to build the capacity of public servants and leaders in our own country. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, Singapore continues to be a strategic partner of South Africa as both a maritime and aviation hub in Southeast Asia. South Africa and Singapore are both gateways into their regions and are home to world-renowned ports. On one hand, South Africa is regarded as a gateway to Southern Africa and arguably Africa as a whole. It is also a base for operation from which economic connection to the rest of the African continent continue to be formed and business developed. Singapore, on the other hand, is considered a gateway to Asia and serves as a regional headquarters to more than 4,000 global companies. It is a first choice for many companies and startups who want to invest in this region. The economy of Singapore is highly developed with a well-educated workforce, which makes Singapore a very competitive choice for many companies. Singapore, like South Africa, is a member of the Indian Ocean Rim Association, the Commonwealth, and most significantly, the Non-Aligned Movement. 
In the spirit of shared development and prosperity, the two countries have signed numerous agreements to enhance cooperation, as I said earlier, in the fields of trade, investment, education, and also defense. Singapore is one of South Africa's largest trading partners in Southeast Asia, with trade between the two countries at approximately 28 billion rand in 2022. South Africa exports a range of products to Singapore, including gold, diamond, and wine, while Singapore exports electronics, chemicals, and machinery to South Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, the growth, development, and emancipation of the African continent from the shackles of poverty, inequality, and underdevelopment remain critical. We believe in the attainment of a better Africa and a better world. We acknowledge that international relations have rapidly changed over the uh, few years and have altered how international agreements are forged and reconfigured. In the process of this global reconfiguration, it is important to look at countries such as Singapore that have been able to turn the tide and inspire international relations, especially from the perspective of South-South relations. As one of Singapore's greatest economic success stories, Singapore has undoubtedly surmounted numerous obstacles, obstacles to development and has emerged as a model of how developing nations can reduce poverty and advance shared prosperity. In this regard, I wish to applaud the role of Singapore in its commitment to the development of African countries. This commitment is evidenced through the Singapore Cooperation Program, which provides various technical assistance programs to other developing countries. We recognize the necessity to continue to forge and strengthen ties through South-South relationships and shape the narrative regarding the role of developing world and emerging economies towards a new global order. Ladies and gentlemen, it is important to frame our imagination of the new global order by emphasizing that Africa as a continent is brimming with opportunities and we have what it takes to be great. Africa is a natural resource-rich continent and has the world's largest free trade area and a 1.2 billion person market. The continent has a potential to forge new development trajectory, harnessing the potential of its resources and people. This year we celebrate the 60th anniversary of the African Union under the theme Accelerating the Implementation of the African Continental free trade area to bring greater prosperity to the continent. The success of the African continental free trade area hinges on the continent's ability to improve and invest in its infrastructure in areas such as electricity generation, transportation, as well as freight and logistics distribution. We have the firm, firm view that investing in infrastructure is crucial to unlocking the potential for Africa to experience growth at a faster rate, but more importantly, to ensure inclusive diversification. As Africa, we are on the right path of development and towards a single African market. As it stands, the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement has effectively created the largest free trade area in the world, measured by the number of countries participating. The pact connects 1.3 billion people across 
54 countries with a combined gross domestic product valued at 3.4 trillion US dollars. It has the potential to lift 30 million people out of extreme poverty and 68 million Africans from moderate poverty. The creation of the vast African continental free trade area regional market is a major opportunity to help African countries diversify their exports, accelerate growth, and attract foreign direct investments. I believe that South Africa presents infinite opportunities, especially from the perspective of expanding investment to Africa, as it is one of the most industrialized economies on the continent. South Africa has a sophisticated banking sector with a major footprint in Africa and is the continent's financial hub. It is the region's principal manufacturing hub and a leading service destination with a highly diversified economic structure in terms of sectoral composition. It is one of the most open economies in the world with access to numeral global markets. Ladies and gentlemen, as I draw this public lecture to conclusion, I wish to take this moment to echo the view that both Singapore and South Africa stand on the shoulders of giants such as Lee, Kanyu, and Nelson Holithatha Mandela, who throughout their lives embodied ethical leadership and a genuine love for people and social justice. We have the responsibility, therefore, to carry their legacy and espouse integrity, compassion, and the recognition of the value of diversity and inclusivity. As Prime Minister Lee Kanyu once said, and I quote, you begin your journey not knowing where it will take you. You have plans, you have dreams, but every now and again, you have to take uncharted roads, face impassable mountains, cross treacherous rivers, be blocked by landslides and earthquake, close quotes. Equally, President Nelson Mandela has this to say. After climbing a great hill, one finds that there are many more hills to climb. Close quote. Ladies and gentlemen, this is essentially the story of both our developmental path as the two nations. In celebrating this centenary of Lee Kanyu's birth, may we embrace and internalize these values of ethical leadership and zero tolerance to corruption and define his leadership as defined by his leadership and that of President Nelson Mandela. As Africans, we find inspiration we find inspiration in Singapore's journey, and we look forward to a future where our nations can also emulate your success story, fostering prosperity, stability, and unity. By embracing these values, we can navigate the complexities of governance, inspire citizens, and pave the way for a brighter future. Lee Kanyu and Nelson Mandela's legacy serve as timeless guide for leaders across the globe, reminding them that visionary leadership grounded in enduring values can shape nations and leave an indelible mark on history. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, and may the legacy of Lee Kanyu 
and Nelson Mandela continue to inspire generations to come. Thank you very much. Deputy President, thank you very much for your words, for such a comprehensive uh, lecture uh, that is focusing obviously on the relationship between your two the two countries, but also looking to the region and at a global level. Um, I'm aware of not having a lot of time, so uh, I would encourage people to think of your question. We have two microphones in the aisle. I'll ask you just briefly to introduce yourself. Um, as you kind of think of your question, maybe I, I start our conversation. Mm -hmm. um, inevitably, I want to bring you back to being in, in, in an education uh, institution. Yeah. Uh, you talk about a lot of these mega trends that are transforming our world. Mm -hmm. uh, from our point of view here in an education institution, we think that learning, knowledge, mm -hmm. is a big part of, of success today. Uh, if you think of your country, you think about Singapore, we think about the area of education and learning, where do you think we can work together? Where are the key challenges that you see ahead in, in learning and education? Yes, we, <coughs> as I said earlier, we have invested a lot in, in education, uh, but also skills. Right. Uh, you know, one of the things that we have been doing since we arrived here was to look at what Singapore is doing around the issue of skills. Uh, we visited ITE, uh, which looks at vocational training. And at, as we speak, our Deputy Minister of Education is working on a partnership uh, with ITE. I mean, we have uh, uh, more than 50 uh, centers of vocational training in, in South Africa and more than 300 uh, institutions or colleges that focus on vocational training. We believe that, uh, you know, having skills will be able to shape the future of our economies. And therefore, we are investing a lot uh, in education and skills. Yesterday, we visited the Minister of Education uh, to further discuss the issue of education and skills. Uh, so I'm convinced that uh, if you provide your population with proper skills, you will be ready uh, to be part of the developing world, the, the advanced economies, uh, so to speak. So that's really what we are doing a lot uh, in our country at the moment. Right. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, we're obviously in Southeast Asia. Mm. You know that you are uh, visiting the region. Um, recently, actually, South Africa has become the first uh, uh, ASEAN uh, sectoral partner. Yeah. Um, it's, so it's obvious to me that South Africa is also looking east and Southeast Asia mm. is becoming an important part uh, of, of your growth. Mm. Um, how, how this region is important to South Africa and what do you think also this region can gain from relationship with South Africa? You mentioned also the South-South cooperation, so I wonder if that's also part of <laughs> that broader conversation. Uh, indeed it is. But maybe let me thank, start by saying we, we want to thank Singapore because you supported us to be part of ASEAN. Yes. So once again, thanks to Singapore, you are really good friends. Uh, <coughs> I, I believe that these relationships are very important. Uh, you know, many people might think Singapore is very far uh, from South Africa, uh, or people might think Asia is too far. But if you look at recent trends and development, you can see that trade volumes are growing gradually uh, between our countries and the region. Uh, in fact, I was very happy when we, when we had the meeting with the president yesterday uh, indicating that uh, Singapore is going to increase its flights to South Africa, uh, you know, almost tenfold. 
And the reason because our people are connecting, are traveling between our countries and the regions, but also business people. We had a meeting with business people yesterday and there are many Singapore business people who are investing in South Africa and vice versa. So, so I think there's huge opportunities and if the regions take South Africa as a gateway into Africa, then you even have much bigger opportunities because they are not just coming to invest in South Africa, but they can invest anywhere in the African continent. And taking advantage of the African continental free trade area uh, to be able to invest. So we do welcome uh, people from uh, the ASEAN region to come and invest in South Africa, to invest in the continent, because indication that trade is growing. Uh, but also people-to-people -people relations. You know, people travel for tourism. Uh, South Africa is one of those uh, attractive tourist destinations. And no wonder that there are so many people uh, traveling between our two countries. So it's, it's really a, a market and area that is de destined to grow even further. And we, we welcome people to come. Yeah. And I want to final a, a global question. Um, yeah. South Africa is the largest economies in the continent, a G20 member, yeah. a BRICS member, chairing the BRICS uh, this year. Um, you mentioned in, in your speech the South-South cooperation and, and uh, many of the challenges that, that you uh, have highlighted uh, might require that degree of cooperation. Yeah. Right? But also it's no secret that we're living in a time of, you call it geopolitical inequalities. Mm. Um, certainly a lot of tensions out there. Uh, what do you feel is the role of South Africa in fostering more cooperation and maybe enhancing some of those reforms that you mentioned at the global level? Do you think there is a space there? There is. I mean, you, you'll recall that our president led a mission uh, to Ukraine and Russia recently uh, with other heads of state because South Africa has always positioned itself as a country that wants peace and uh, playing that role uh, throughout the world. Uh, we're taking the same posture with uh, Israel and Palestine that only negotiations can bring a lasting solution. We do the same in the continent. Uh, I recently visited uh, South Sudan, where the president has asked me to engage with the warring parties there to bring about peace. They will have elections next year, and so we do hope that uh, you know we we can achieve a, a peaceful resolution in South Sudan and also other parts of the world. So. <clears throat> I believe that South Africa can continue to play an important role uh, in many uh, of these uh, areas. Uh, in Ukraine, as I said, and currently looking at uh, the issues of, of, of uh, Israel and Palestine. But also, apart from you know, pushing for peaceful resolution, we also uh, want to see development. And I think that's our key role as we engage with other countries. That's really what we want to see. Uh, because peace must be about development uh, to change the lives of ordinary people for the better. And South Africa is going to continue uh, to play that leading role. Um, uh, I know that uh, sometimes uh, people say maybe we, uh, you know, are trying to uh, take too much uh, ourselves, but where we can, we are going to continue to assist in leading. Uh, we can't do it alone. It has always to be in partnership with others. Great. Thank you for that. May I invite now from the audience uh, questions? Um, if you can just briefly introduce yourself. Mm. 
maybe you must ask per region. Uh, Africa, my new question. <laughs> maybe easier that way. Right. Thank you. In Singapore, everything that is local is national. Do you and mind to introduce versa. yourself, sorry. Oh, Matthew Rafat, owner of Lononaut Agency. Thank you. In Singapore, everything local is also national and vice versa because of its size. Yeah. Other countries do not enjoy such an efficient relationship between the governmental bodies. Now, you've had almost, you've had many jobs in the government in South Africa from top to bottom. What is your opinion if there is a conflict between the local and the national bodies? Do you favor, given your experience, more national control or more local control? Thank you. Yeah, in, in South Africa, we have three layers of, of governance. Uh, it's national government, it's provincial, and local. Local is your municipalities. So you're quite right. Uh, there can be tension, and, and it, there has been in the past. But we then introduce uh, what we call cooperative governance. Uh, in other words, each sphere respect the independence of the other, but they cooperate in terms of uh, saving the people, delivering services. And the, the, the way you get it to work, you create a fora where these various uh, uh, levels can interact. So, for example, the president convenes what we call the uh, presidential coordinating forum, and the premiers of all provinces will attend that meeting, uh, and sometimes the executive mayors as well, and then they discuss issues of, of uh, common interests. Uh, the ministers themselves also have their own such meetings, which we call MinMEX, where minister and the uh, members of provincial executive come together uh, with uh, the executive mayors and they look at issues. Uh, it works uh, because you have an opportunity to engage, uh, look at, at, at common issues. Uh, recently, the president introduced what we call the district development model, uh, which the president has asked me to lead. With that model, we ensure that as national government goes to provinces, they work with the premiers and the mayors at local level so that the national government doesn't come and build a bridge, but the province is not aware or the province is doing something else. So we, we coordinate and work together. So that really has taken away a lot of tension uh, because we regard ourselves as a unitary state. So we, we have to cooperate. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Dr. Samir Puri. I'm an associate fellow at Chatham House, the UK uh, international affairs think tank. Uh, thank you for a really wide-ranging lecture. I want to pick up on Professor Mancini's last question um, about how South Africa's foreign policy has been changed by 12 years of BRICS membership. And very specifically, I guess the biggest uh, public announcement in Johannesburg was the expansion of BRICS, which is going to take place early next year. Um, What's your view on how that expansion of BRICS will address that really striking phrase that you used of geopolitical inequality? Mm. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much. We, we have welcomed new members into BRICS, as you say. Uh, Saudi Arabia uh, has come in, UAE uh, has come in, and and we think that uh, it's going to help to strengthen BRICS and expand the horizon uh, of development. I think one thing that 
perhaps I should say is that uh, if you look at the growth of BRICS now, I mean, in terms of volumes of trade, uh, they've, in a sense, now eclipsed the G20. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's been growing f faster and faster. Uh, and that's good for the countries of the South. Uh, to, it's not necessarily that uh, we're going to be anti-West. It's, it's just that as countries of the South, the more strong you are, the more you can play on an equal basis on the world platform. So we continue uh, to work with the EU, we can continue to work with the U.S. Uh, as BRICS countries. Uh, I know that there are more others who want to join. The leaders of BRICS are still uh, you know, discussing that. I know Turkey wants to join, and, and many other countries in the continent uh, want to be part of BRICS. Uh, but we will continue uh, to to engage with uh, other institutions in the West. I mean, recently, uh, South Africa hosted AGOA, and many people were worried that now that we are very strong in BRICS and uh, you have been doing a lot of uh, work in the East, we will abandon the West. But that's not the case. In fact, AGOA was, AGOA was very successful um, uh, in South Africa recently, uh, and we're going to continue that trend. I know we have a hard deadline um, at 11, but I might maybe take one more question. Is that okay with you? Yes. Please. Uh, good morning, Your Excellency. My name is Jonathan. I'm a lecturer at the local Institute of Higher Learning. Thank you for the very insightful lecture. So my question is, uh, as South Africa and Singapore continues on the very good diplomatic relations, what are some ways that both nations can work in the areas of water sustainability and uh, climate change? Thank you. I don't think so water, water, sustainability, climate change, um, these important areas of cooperation between South Africa and Singapore a particular project, particular uh, things that the two countries can do together? Uh, yes, in fact, uh, as I said earlier, when I came here, I came with uh, many deputy ministers, um, and uh, one of the deputy ministers is very interested in that area uh, of how we manage water resources, but looking at issues of climate change, because she is a deputy minister for environment, uh, uh, fisheries, and foresters. So we we are we are already partnering with Singapore. Uh, minister uh, Chrissy uh, has been in discussion uh, with Singapore on on various aspects. Uh, of course, the deputy minister is here. She is in. I think they are in, in Dubai. You know, they are in Dubai at, at COP28 where they are discussing these issues. There, there's a lot we, we can do together uh, because as South Africa, we're taking the issues of environment very uh, seriously in, in, what, uh, in what we do. Uh, and I know Singapore uh, as well has had a lot of uh, initiatives that... Uh, contribute towards us, uh, making sure that uh, we address the problem of global warming. Uh, so, so through this partnership, I think we will be able to, uh, to, to work with, with yourselves uh, in, in various aspects of the work that we are doing. Great. Um, I think we have run of time. I want to thank you very much for all of you for coming uh, today. Thank you, Deputy President, for uh, the lecture, for your time, for your thoughts, um, and please join me for a round of applause uh, to thanks, Deputy President. Yeah.